Good afternoon. All right. So let me get your names down. Uh, welcome to the uh, History 102 coverage of the West and Turner's thesis. All right. So let's see here. All right, so as I'm getting these down, let's see here. I want to um, just kind of uh, ask, are there any general questions? Anything that's not quite clear in the class, et cetera? Hello, thank you for coming. All right, a few of you, what I may ask is for a, um, let me get finished with the list. Okay, Draper. Yes, is there a question? All right, let's see here and put more. Great, great. All right, so now, um, Jaylene, um, Ricky, and Shamgar, could I get you guys to type or or to unmute yourself for a moment and give me your last names, please? My last name is Vera. V -E -R -A. All right. Thank you, Ricky. Yeah, no problem. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Jaylene Ramirez. Okay, great. Let's see here. Shamgar Orion. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right, thank you guys. All right, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is jump right into this week's assignment, okay? And um, uh, we're gonna share the page. So let's see here, Turner's thesis and the West. So I, I do kind of a 180 as I often do. On the first number, I try to support his thesis. It's kind of a romantic thesis, right? If you've had a chance to read it yet, um, he contends that, um, the West made America into what it stands for, that the West represents Americana, what we identify with as our uh, residing trait or characteristic as a country. And what is that? That is equality general relative compared to other countries, um, equality of opportunity, right? equality of economic opportunity. They call it socioeconomic mobility or socioeconomic ascension moving up the socioeconomic pyramid, uh, rising from rags to riches, right? We've seen that in our, our propaganda, uh, in literature, uh, in culture, right? To, to, to raise yourself up by your own merit, whatever you earn and deserve. And the idea was, right, is he does a contrast and he contends that, although I didn't put it in here, that on the East Coast, most of the, the best seats are already taken, so to speak, right? That most opportunities for advancement um, are, are already being taken. You got to figure he wrote this in 1892, uh, around in that time. And so by that time, the robber barons, as we're going to get to next, uh, began taking over entire industries, right? Carnegie and steel, Rockefeller and oil, uh, Jay Gould and, and the stock market. And so you have these, these kind of autocratic empires in the capitalist system on the East Coast, and they're gobbling everybody else up. And so he says the West, it renewed American meritocracy. It renewed the chance to somewhat level the playing field and give generally everyone um, an opportunity to advance, to do something with him or herself, with his or her life. 
all right, including women in a very patriarchal time, uh, at least limitedly and relative to the East Coast, he, said, he states. And so how does he set this up? Well, firstly, right, is kind of the idea of, uh, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, no pain, no gain. We have all kinds of uh, axioms that we contend in American culture that, that, that go hand in hand with capitalism is that, you know, kind of the, uh, the hero's journey uh, by a guy named Joseph Campbell, who sees different traits and uh, common characteristics in different cultures and their, their religions and their myths and their, and their, uh, their culture. And at any rate, he said, you know, he talked about the, the hero's journey, that, you know, uh, nothing is as sweet in gaining uh, as far as like success as having to go through adversity and overcome hardship, right? So that romanticizes the whole American dream is that the fact that it's tough to attain. But remember, the key to this thesis is that supposedly it's tough for everyone, right? Uh, and it, it doesn't play favorites. So how do we see that? Well, we see that, right, with supposedly, you know, depictions of indiscriminate dangers that existed out in the West. Because you have to remember, you know, the West was claimed by Native Americans. The West was claimed in Louisiana Territory going throughout the West uh, by the French and the Spanish back and forth. Uh, but, they, but they rather sparsely populated that region. It was predominantly Native Americans, and even including Spanish and later Mexican West. Um, of course, you had the main 21 missions in the cities of, of California, the Spanish cities, um, the Pueblos. But when you look at the, the, the population of California, it, it, it was small. Uh, it, was, it was pretty small. And so at any rate, a lot of this land which had just, and from your 101 class, right? Remember in, uh, Jefferson bought the Louisiana territory and he kept it under territorial status. So the natives, those who had lived under Spain and France and under Mexico, uh, they continued to live there, of course. They continued to devise their own laws, et cetera. But nominally or on paper, uh, the American government put, um, what was it, 11 men in the North and 11 men in the South. Uh, to dictate law, new laws, American laws. And of course, that didn't go over too well, and it didn't go over too effectively uh, for several decades. But by the end of the Mexican-American War um, in 1848, uh, now you're going to have, starting in 1843, a mad dash of tens of thousands, and then of course more than that, uh, American migrants from the East travel over land into this far Western territory. But before that, right, we had something known as the Northwest Ordinances, and they were devised when we tried a Confederacy in your 101 class, and it didn't last, obviously. We're under our second government, under our republic that we have now. But when the Founding Fathers tried that, they, they issued lasting or what were meant to be lasting ordinances about taking the West. And what they contended is that it was to be systematic and organized. Uh, you were to have a land survey office come in and put everything into six square acre plots. So hence you see when you fly in an airplane and you see these nice square uh, allotments in the land uh, from, from your airplane window. Uh, that, that was devised by the, uh, that was a typical European way of, of carving up land, uh, an English way, and um, they, they implemented that with the Northwest Ordinances. So the land survey team is supposed to come in, they survey it, uh, so, many, so much acreage uh, for a state, uh, then it's uh, subdivided into counties, and the counties subdivided into cities or towns. And then the towns and cities are subdivided themselves. And so at, at the proper time, they are, to, um, they are to auction off the land. And they put limitations, right, that, that you can't charge at one time. It was two cents an acre, more than two cents an acre uh, for the land. But nevertheless, there was a systematic way of purchasing it and settling it, et cetera. But when you find in some of these areas around the end of the, the Mexican period, uh, 
um, you don't find that the Northwest ordinance being carried out. And so you see this mad dash of humanity uh, crash upon these Western lands that are now nominally uh, federal domain, but they've yet to be subdivided uh, uh, into their proper counties and cities, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a fiasco as far as trying to claim the land. And so uh, you also have the Homestead Act, uh, the Homestead Acts, and they were they predominantly pertain to Kansas uh, and into the, the the Great Basin. There, uh, they um, they they granted 160 acres uh, of virtually free land. In some cases, you had to pay a nominal fee of ten dollars. But even back then, with deflation, that wasn't out of the the realm of possibility to pay. So for the very most $10, you could receive 160 acres of, of free land, uh, of, of land. Um, an additional 160 if you agreed to plant trees, an additional if you agree to uh, establish a public school. And so historians like Paul Johnson, he's a court historian, he praises everything American. And so he's very biased, right, in, in, in praising the winners. Uh, but he contends that it was one of the most generous acts of a, of a modern government as far as land ownership in modern history. And this happened in 1862 during the Civil War. So in some cases, land was divvied out. Uh, you also, by the time of Andrew Jackson's time period in the early 1830s, uh, the courts began to become more liberal in granting uh, squatters rights. So if you go upon land, and no one is improving or cultivating that land, no one around to seem to claim that land, you can lay first claim to it by virtually just trespassing, squatting on it, uh, building a home, and began cultivating crops, etc. And then there was a myriad of circumstances, it, it varied from region to region. In some cases, you were merely given the first rights to buy it, so it, it was, it was, um, it was extricated from the auction process and you were able to just buy it at the base minimal level. In some cases, you were required not to sell it and to live on it for a certain number of years and it was yours. And then in some cases, it was yours outright. And so with Turner's thesis, right, you see both here. You see the danger of all this ambiguity regarding land ownership uh, that, that everyone faced uh, supposedly moving into the West, but you also have opportunities. So notice he says the West leveled the playing field regarding dangers and regarding opportunities. When I say dangers, right, I think of the gold rush. Uh, they, they forsook, uh, you know, carrying out the Northwest ordinances with the gold rush in California, even though it had been surveyed pretty well by the Spanish and Mexican governments prior to this, but they didn't acknowledge that. Um, on paper, according to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War on February 2nd of 1848, um, the, the, the Mexican people, uh, the Californios, the, the Tejanos, those that were in these states taken by the United States during that war or just prior to the war, and, um, but were ethnically, culturally Mexican, right? Uh, they were granted automatic citizenship according to that treaty. But when you look at Chicano histories, right, from their perspective, I think of uh, um, our Felipe Armesto, a guy named Felipe with the last name Felipe Armesto. Um, he, uh, he has a book called Our America, and he shows how that was disregarded, absolutely disregarded. Um, bullion, extortion, People go into the, 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 the Mexican people with guns and threatening them. But what happened oftentimes is the Mexican people had, um, the, the Mexican owners owned a lot of land and it was pastoral oftentimes. And so land with, with, with sheep and cows and cattle and horses, and they'd have them roam. And so it looked a lot like our in our vicinity, like, you know, Highway 108 going up into Sonora, uh, whereby you look from left to right and you don't know in the undulating hills and mountains, you know, what belongs to the public domain and what is privately owned. 
uh, because it's not being cultivated and it's not fenced off, etc. So at any rate, people came and just squatted on land that they thought was there for the taking. And so uh, Turner very conveniently, uh, you know, bypasses and doesn't spend much time on the fact that someone's gain entailed someone else's loss. Uh, and namely, we're talking about the, the previous owners and inhabitants of this land, those under uh, French and Spanish Louisiana territory, and those under the Mexican states uh, in the far west. And of course, you can't forget uh, predominantly the Native Americans. So at any rate, um, you had dangers of, of people contesting for land, for minerals. When the gold rush happened, right, people rushed in, up into the foothills. And um, according to the, um, you know, the sources, like I, I use H.W. Brands quite often. I recommend him. He's got a great book on the, um, on the gold rush. And then the older kind of um, uh, better known book is called The World Rushed In by J.H. Holiday or J.S. Holiday, I'm sorry. And at any rate, they contend that uh, they have uh, Spanish speaking newspapers that contended that people were taking, uh, finding thousands of dollars worth of gold right in the beds of the American, the Consumnes, the Feather, and other rivers in the Sacramento Valley. And at the superficial or placer level, uh, and it didn't require a lot of skill. It didn't re require a lot of um, technique or knowledge or expertise. And so the first people there, they, they got the best of the diggings, right? And so there were opportunities. But nevertheless, if you put a pickaxe down in a, in a spot that you had claimed with your hat on it, that was supposed to culturally and formally tell other people you claim that mine first. Uh, but what happens with people with more men and more guns come across that pickaxe? They just throw it to the ground and they tell you to get out. And then what happens when there is ethnic animosity? Uh, hey, Mexican, uh, because to them, right, there was no delineating between a Mexican American who was now entitled to all the rights of American citizenship by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War, and a Mexican migrant coming from Sinaloa and Sonora and the northern Mexico states. When they heard about the gold rush, they rushed in. Also, Chileans came in large number, and the Chileans used mercury and had techniques from experience down in Chile that, that offered them the opportunity to be very successful. So then you have that kind of jealousy that comes in, into play and, and racial animosity. And so it was dangerous. It was dangerous having this kind of free-for-all with, with, with these vague, if even existent, boundaries and rules on, on, on property ownership, et cetera. Uh, I mean, look at the, uh, the miners' associations. There were no, since there were no cities yet and city ordinances yet in the mining towns, et cetera, uh, they had no sheriff, they had no police department. And so people would come in and, and chaos would ensue uh, and according to, to some of the primary source from that time period, uh, newspaper accounts. And um, the miners would organize themselves and devise their own code of laws their own punishments for infractions, and they would try and convict and punish uh, those suspects that, who were found guilty. And in some cases, it was like a kangaroo court, right? It was like you were, you were guilty before they even began. And it was just kind of a, a, a formality of them going through the motions of trying to give you what was certainly not due process um, to, to, you know, uh, defend your innocence. So at any rate, um, they, had, um, they had hanging trees where they would hang people. I mean, they put justice into their own hands. And another case to that, which is as quasi, it's almost one itself, the Miners Association, is you have vigilante groups where they got tired of, of the lack of law and order and violence 
And so they they pretty much deb, they self deputized themselves, right, and decided to take law into their own hands uh, into the West. And then you have cases, right, of of, of infamous um, brigands, uh, robbers, uh, outlaws uh, coming in throughout all throughout the West, and them facing um, either a desperate government who sent over marshals and deputies, and the marshals and deputies came in small order. And in some cases, I kid you not, there was a gentleman known as the hanging judge all the way back in Oklahoma, was sending deputies and marshals all the way into the far west with lists of men. And in one infamous case, I wish I could recall his name. I have it in my notes somewhere. Uh, but at any rate, he told them, in all likelihood, I've seen these names come up again and again. So if you have, if they don't cooperate, just shoot them on sight and don't worry about giving them uh, <laughs> their due process and a trial. And so, you know, there's a reason why, you know, people are uh, in Hollywood are sometimes fixated uh, perhaps on the West. Uh, they like that dystopian you know, scenario, Lord of the Flies type thing, right? When the kids found themselves marooned on the island and there's no government, there are no institutions, and just you're 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 down to the the primacy of human nature, and 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 see what happens, and so uh, that that still resonates today, doesn't it? And so the the Western genre in in uh, in in theater is still very strong and alluring. Uh, to the American public, uh, gener generation after generation. And so you have those types of, of instances to show uh, the image of a, of a kind of a lawless wild west. Uh, you have cases of the overland trails, right? And with these overland trails, uh, you had a guy as early as 1812 named Robert Stewart, who wrote a diary of coming back backward, uh, pretty much along the Oregon Trail from Oregon uh, into uh, Missouri. And um, all the stereotypical things you see in, in, in very, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of hyperbole, exaggeration uh, in, in some of these depictions of, of, of this time period going into the far west uh, prior to the Civil War, especially. But, but you find it in his diary. You have cases of them drinking their own urine. Uh, being attacked by wild animals, uh, being extorted by the crow, uh, the Mandan, and other tribes, right, that, that, that forced them at gunpoint to give them some of their supplies or else they threatened to kill them on the spot. You had certain tribes that did not take a liking to people passing through their territory, uh, the Shoshone or snake natives and the, the, Sierra, the Sierra Nevada, uh, and of course the Comanche and the Apache, along the Santa Fe Trail and the Navajo. And so um, in Kansas, they were trying to build a railroad and the Kiowa and the Pawnee and other tribes were attacking the, the people uh, so passionately that they had to send troops there to fight and protect the workers as they were building the railroad tracks. Never mind the fact that they had broken their promise to the natives uh, not to build a railroad through their territory. But at any rate, you know, and so you have cases like that um, of uh, people drowning in the Platte River, in the Columbia and the Snake Rivers, right? And um, you have uh, old school historians like uh, Candy Moulton, who give stats on uh, people trying to make um, money from cattle. See, the Spanish had left thousands of head of cattle and they had multiplied. Um, from 1540, from Vasquez de Coronado's expedition up in through the Southwest uh, into likely Kansas. And so, especially in Texas, et cetera, you had just an innumerable number of cattle uh, freely roaming. Well, President Hayes, I believe it was, uh, opened free, kind of like Polk did, and opening up the gold rush and saying, we're not co covering the Northwest ordinances, just go trespass with our permission and take what you can get, first come, first serve. They did, uh, Hayes did the same thing with cattle, as long as it ostensibly was not uh, branded yet. And so people came down to get cattle 
And then of course, uh, there began the organic development of railroad tracks stretching down toward Texas and into the West. But before then, it was the time of the great cattle run of the cowboy, right? Uh, during the Civil War and a few years after uh, in the 1860s. And so um, if you were brave enough to, to you know, to uh, traverse the land, uh, take on all the problems and issues and, and dangers uh, of a cattleman's life, uh, you could make a lot of money. At one given time, one steer uh, could sell for $75 on the East Coast, just one, and that's $75 back then. But the problem is, right, with Kenny Moulton and other historians who go over it, they give large stats of people who were killed in accidents, gored to death, uh, died of frostbite or hypothermia, uh, drowned in rivers, uh, were killed by Native Americans, uh, et cetera. Just a myriad of dangers that they faced. Uh, you guys are much too young, but I remember as a kid uh, in the 80s, uh, we used to have a Oregon Trail. <laughs> and you would, you would see your figure traveling across one of these overland trails and it didn't take long for him to say, oh, you have an issue. Uh, your, your son has dysentery. Uh, or you had a, you lost a family member in the Platte River, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it kind of goes along with that motif of the West of being inherently dangerous. You have extremes of topography, uh, right? The Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, uh, you know, a lot more people would have died had it not been for the, the, the passes, right? The North Pass going through um, the Rocky Mountains, like a uh, was it a, at least two miles, like a two mile in width gap uh, in the mountains so that you didn't have to cross over the top with your Conestoga wagon and your family and all your supplies, et cetera. There were certain months of the year you did not dare traverse that land, right? And, um, and that, that's why a lot of people um, who had more money uh, paid for scouts right, the, the, the fur traders, uh, the famous guys like uh, Tom Fitzpatrick and uh, Hugh Glass and uh, Kit Carson and Jedediah Smith, uh, the rich people could pay for them uh, to show them the shortcuts, uh, to get through native tribes that they had become friendly through uh, relations and, and trading in the past, uh, et cetera. And so at any rate, but obviously if you were a common person, you didn't have the money to pay for a scout. So what they oftentimes did is they congregated together and they would write their own constitution before they left Missouri and agree upon certain rules and regulations and responsibilities that each would engage in and embrace uh, as they crossed across uh, the continent. So you do have evidence to somewhat support Turner's thesis that the West was during the mid, the er, throughout the 1800s, basically, at least up into the 1890s, um, that it was rather, in some cases, lawless, um, severe, uh, dangerous, highly contested, um, violent. But then you have a guy named Carl Metz, and he writes a book, and he shows about like the, the gunslingers in the Western towns, right? And, uh, and he contends that, you know what, statistically, you are more likely still to experience or observe a murder uh, in Chicago, Boston, or New York City than you were in some of these mining, infamous mining and, and cattle towns. Because with the cattle towns, for instance, right, with the mining towns, it goes without saying, is you have people that are going in there for a rush. So a lot of them happen to be young single men. And um, when they came in, and especially in the early phases, like in 1848 in the gold rush, in 1863 in the Comstock load of Nevada, uh, in 1876 in the Dakotas, uh, they were getting a lot of money right off the bat. And people came in to mine them, basically. Uh, entertainment, drinking, prostitution, all kinds of different things came in to try to lure that money out of their hands, right? as they met there uh, at these spots. And the same thing with cattle towns. And that's as far as the railroad stretched 
at the end of the railroad or of the cattle drives, right? Especially from Southern uh, Texas up the, Ch the famous Chisholm Trail. And so uh, you have places, especially in, um, in Kansas uh, that, that that's as far as the railroads uh, made it as far as the 1870s. And so you had some infamous cattle towns in Kansas uh, where thousands of young men came in and herded the cattle that they had taken uh, and were selling it onto the train depot, received large amount of cash. And then of course there was plenty of entertainment and things to spend their money on in that cattle town. And so, um, but again, historians like Carl Metz say, well, it wasn't as dangerous statistically per capita um, as it was, or it might've been per capita per person, but at least at large, there weren't as many murders in Kansas, in Montana, in Wyoming, uh, in Arizona and New Mexico uh, as there were still in New York. So, you know, some people think that there is some, some gross exaggeration on Turner's thesis, this rough and rowdy wild west. All right. But as far as opportunities, I've named a few. Uh, one is access to land, whether it's just by squatting, whether it's by receiving a homestead, um, or whether, whether it's by bullying, extortion, as some did to the Hispanics uh, in, in the far west, uh, taking at least parcels of their land. Um, then you also have mineral rushes. And once again, in almost every case, you had to be there early. Those who got there first uh, did well, okay? And, and, and you have some, some famous bonanza kings, as they were called, who rose from rags to riches. Another avenue toward the American dream, of course, was entrepreneurial. If you followed the railroad, you knew that there were gonna be cities and towns attached to that railroad and, um, and that there would be uh, inhabitants therein. And so you just had to find a good, a service uh, that would be coveted, demanded by the people. And not only that, a flood of East Coast as well as European capital flooded into the West by the 1870s. And so now you have access to loans. And as they say, right, it takes money to make money, uh, wanting to start you know, to perhaps buy a boarding house and, and, and begin an inn, right? And pay people at like a hotel to stay in your rooms, uh, a billiards hall, a bar, whatever it might be, a bordello. Um, you, you could get a loan and, and uh, to get established, to get your, your, your first foot forward uh, in that business. Um, the Chinese uh, did so well uh, as they flooded in during the gold rush and then subsequently with the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, they, they flooded in, it was like, my goodness, 1848, there were fewer than a thousand on the California census. And by 1852, there were over 40,000 uh, Chinese immigrants uh, coming in. And a lot of them came in through the Cooley system, the Cooley, C-O-O-L-I-E, that was the informal name they gave it. And it was a system that was established in, oh goodness, I wanna say the Philippines, but I know Hawaiian Islands, uh, but I know elsewhere as well. But let's just stick to the Hawaiian Islands so that I'm, I'm certain about. Uh, they would work uh, in, the sugar, in the sugar fields, et cetera. And they would have, they would pretty much be like modern indentured servants. Uh, they, would, they would work as serfs for a certain allotment of years and have their debts paid off and be granted supplies and money at the end of their term. And so the Chinese, they came in, uh, Johan von Suter, known as John Sutter, uh, in the Sacramento Valley, the Mexican government put him there to check the gringos coming in across the Sierra Nevada, uh, from Nevada into California. And he brought in a lot of coolie laborers, et cetera. Um, another thing that happened was uh, uh, Charles Crocker, one of the famous four leaders of the Central Pacific Railroad, um, he uh, made a famous bet that was publicized that his Chinese laborers could lay a mile of track in a day. And they did so easily. 
And so they developed a reputation for being ideal laborers, the Chinese that is, uh, in that they were um, diligent, that they worked hard, and that they were efficient, that they got a lot done in a certain allotment of time, and that they were docile. And remember docile, right, is that they're meek and humble and they do as they're told and they're not rebellious and they don't have any sense of entitlement. So hence, sadly, that last adjective, right, implies that they were easily exploited or taken advantage of. But with the ideal, them being labeled as the ideal laborer, uh, railroad companies, mining companies, and others that, that flooded into the West eventually uh, wanted to employ Chinese laborers. And then labor unions uh, erupted amongst um, WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, um, Irish immigrant, and even Mexican-American uh, laborers uh, demanding that the Chinese not be employed and stop taking everybody's jobs. And then of course, there was a violent backlash. Uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, the Chinatown of San Francisco, uh, the Chinatown of Seattle, they have cases of violence against the Chinese, uh, the resentment that they were taking people's jobs. So eventually when you get the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, uh, it ironically begins with a compliment on the Chinese and saying that as they do seem to uh, represent the ideal laborer, they're taking Americans' jobs. So I, I kid you not, the Chinese Exclusion Act ends with a stereotypical essentialist, right, um, uh, compliment to the Chinese. And so at any rate, Turner overlooks that though, doesn't he? Because he's wanting to look at opportunities for everyone. So like I said, grabbing land, gaining minerals, uh, starting a business of some sort, providing a, a, a service or a, a good or product uh, for the, uh, the pioneers going there or the inhabitants already there, uh, those constituted some of the major avenues through which you could achieve the American dream. And that included the Chinese. They did well for themselves. Uh, I, I know it's a terrible stereotype, but st statistically, the numbers just show it. Uh, but with restaurants, opium dens, inns, and, um, and laundries, uh, they did very well in providing those services and charging the miners for them, so much so that there was a backlash. And so, um, but with the, the Hispanic population or demographic, right, is oftentimes those who were here first in 1848, who were already Californios, or were from Sonora or from a Northern Mexico state that, that allowed them to get here more quickly into California foothills than someone from the East Coast, right? Uh, or from elsewhere, people came from all over, Australia, Europe, et cetera, South America. Uh, they did very well for themselves, but again, there was a backlash, right? And so in, I believe 1851, they passed foreign miners tax uh, against anyone, let's see here, in brief, the law decreed that only native or naturalized citizens of the U.S., so that should have include, included Mexican Americans, right? But as far as I'm concerned, from what I've read, they did not distinguish Mexican Americans from Mexican migrants, right? They kind of lumped them together and contended that they were all in, coming in from Mexico itself rather than inhabitants therein in California already. So in brief, the law decreed that only native or naturalized citizens of the US would be permitted to mine in California without a license, the cost of which would be $20 per month. And $20 per month was an exorbitantly high fee back then, right? And so that goes against Turner's thesis as well, right? because he's talking about how the West opened up relative to the East, at least, equality of opportunity, but evidently not for Hispanics and not for Asian Americans or Asian immigrants, right? Uh, there was a lot of exploitation uh, and, and discrimination, as you see in the foreign miners taxes. Uh, it would take just another year and they'll pass a miners tax uh, charging, um, it was, 
I want to say $3 per person, uh, but it was a charge per person coming in by boat into San Francisco. So it, it was aimed toward uh, very uh, overtly toward uh, Chinese immigrants. And so at any rate, they had to pay a fee uh, to come in and mine. And so, you know, they didn't do that with WASP, with kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans and, and other demographics here. And so, um, goodness, let's see here. You have um, the fact of money as well, is at first, mineral rushes were a successful endeavor for virtually anyone first there. But once the superficial level mineral uh, wealth was extracted, how are you going to go hundreds of feet into a mountainside? And that's a rhetorical question. You're not. Uh, no pickaxe can do that. So what happens, right, is according to our textbook, Alan Brinkley, the vast majority of mineral wealth that was extracted from the West, right, was extracted by machinery. Uh, the pneumatic or uh, air-powered and hydraulic or water-powered drills, they're about as big, big as an oil derrick and just blasted into the sides of mountains uh, to get to the ore. Um, who could afford that? Machinery. I tell you who could, corporations. Ever since the 1840s, you have corporations that form, that join their capital, right? That um, allow people to buy common stock uh, on the stock market and they get to play with other people's money. You can't compete with that, with a corporation, with the capital that they start with, right? The money that they get to play with. And so then what they do, right, is they end up extracting most of the mineral wealth from, uh, from the West, and they end up hiring different people. And, you know, a, not to get conspiracy theory on you, but in some cases, they encouraged uh, rivalry between demographics. So in some cases, right, they would just hire Chinese, and, and, and uh, especially if the Hispanic uh, laborers made any kind of demands as far as decent wages and work conditions, et cetera. They say, fine, we're hiring the Chinese. And so that happened often. And now you're paid almost nothing an hour. You have no commission for if you're manning a machine and it taps into an ore, there's no commission for you. All the wealth goes to the corporation and not to you. They even went so far as having cavity searches at the end of the day to make sure no one was trying to smuggle any of the corporation's mineral wealth uh, from the workplace, from the spot. And so uh, same thing uh, in farming. You have the invention of the mechanical reaper, uh, the mechanical thresher, the harvester combine. And according to historian Howard Zinn, that machinery could do in about three and a half hours what would take a few weeks for several, for over a dozen men to do. And so in the name of efficiency, you just can't compete with that. And not to mention, if they can afford machinery like that, chances are when they do finally start opening up um, sales, because the railroads were granted tons of land in the West, right? Um, oftentimes, right? For every mile of track that they laid on flat land, they would get like 11 square miles of land alongside it. If it were uh, mountainous, they would get like 14 miles, even more, because it was the idea that it was more expensive for them to blast through the mountains. So they rewarded them with a higher acreage of land. Well, the railroads, you think they just benevolently gave that land away? No, they sold it and they tried to maximize their sales and selling the property as highly as they could. So oftentimes it was corporate and wealthy people who alone could buy uh, the railroad lands uh, that stretched along the sides of the, um, the Central Pacific, the Union Pacific, the, um, the uh, Santa Fe and uh, Topeka and other railroads uh, going through the West. And so, um, yeah, it, so, his thesis ignores that as well, that those with money, you're, you're still not really talking about equality of opportunity. Those who had more money had better opportunities uh, to, to one up 
their, their uh, common contemporaries. And so they bought more land, they farmed more land, they did it more efficiently. And oftentimes, as we get into the next topic, they even received rebates from railroads if they were shrewd, if they were shrewd enough to have an option of two or more, right, railroads uh, to, um, to transport their, their produce, they would make them compete for their service. Why? Because the railroads could charge per pound. And so they could make a lot of money from the big farmers, the big miners, et cetera, right? Because there was a lot in quantity and mass um, that, that they needed transported. And so that's a lot of pounds to charge them for. So they would make demands and say, hey, if you don't give me some type of a rebate uh, or, 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 you know, um, storing my grain or something, right, in such high quantities, then I'm going to go with your competitor instead. So they would get rebates. They would get reductions in the cost per pound. And of course, if you were a common, you know, uh, farmer there in the West, uh, a small scale cash crop farmer growing some crop uh, to sell at the market, good luck in competing with the big farmers. And the same thing with ranching. Uh, by 1873, barbed wire was invented and the big guys bought up a vast majority of land uh, were able to hire hundreds or even more of cattle hands to go and find and brand cattle and bring them back onto their premises and fence it off. And so then the, ca the, the cowboy, his heyday was quick, quickly over. Uh, there was no longer a need for the drive, that dangerous cattle drive, because the railroads eventually made it all the way into the far west. And so uh, people just had ranches built uh, near railroad depots. Um, and, and again, uh, the big cattle guys were able to, um, to muscle out uh, the smaller guys, especially when it came to contracts uh, for like um, cattle being sold to uh, forts, to military forts and soldiers, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, they, they had oftentimes higher quality, a much higher dependable quantity uh, of beef to offer. And so they went with the big guys, uh, the, the government that is, in making these contracts. And you had civil wars over that, as you see in the story of Billy the Kid, right? In the Lincoln County Wars of New Mexico. So let me try to move down here. Are you guys still with me? I haven't lulled you to sleep, have I? I'm still here. I'm listening. Not Thank all, you. sir. Thank you. All right. All right. So, so see, I, this is the Dalton gang and the Dalton gang. Uh, they, uh, the legend states that, that loved ones killed by the Dalton gang uh, formed themselves a vigilante posse, chased them all the way down from Kansas uh, into the, the Texas border of Mexico and got in a gunfight and killed the members of the Dalton gang and then put their bodies up as trophies as to what would happen to anybody else who tried to terrorize their loved ones and their towns. Uh, there's the, the Minnesota Norfolk robbery of Jesse James. Same thing. Uh, instead of police, it was the actual inhabitants who opened fire in that Minnesota town on him and his gang. And they broke up after that, and, and shortly everything went awry for them. Uh, there's a case in um, uh, Meeker, M-E-E-K-E-R, Colorado, in the 1890s. Same thing. Uh, a, a gang came up and tried to rob a bank, and every one of them was killed by an inhabitant uh, because there was a guy named John Huggis who was across the street from the bank and, and at his uh, store, uh, where he sold guns amongst other items. Uh, he handed the guns out to the inhabitants. They got on roofs of, of, of uh, buildings, et cetera, and waited for uh, Jim Shirley's gang to come back out of the bank and they killed every one of them. Uh, just these inhabitants, regular inhabitants. Uh, you have uh, Baxter and Caldwell as Western cities who deputized every member of the town uh, to shoot a cowboy on sight that came into their town. 
because they were tired of their raids coming in and terrorizing the people. You have John Wesley Harden there in the middle. Uh, he killed about four lawmen before he himself was killed by a lawman in a bar. Um, he also uh, went down anecdotally for uh, at a hostel, uh, shooting a man for snoring. Uh, and then, of course, you have Billy the Kid uh, next to him involved in the Lincoln County Wars, uh, where they were trying to get beef uh, contracts with the local military fort. And the sheriff was dirty and got involved and uh, had his boss murdered. And he and the regulators sought revenge. They killed the mayor and they caused a lot of havoc there in New Mexico before Pat Garrett got him. So, you know, you do have evidence of, of a kind of, a, you know, out of the ordinary, anomalously wild west. You do. As far as, you know, some of those dangers being a bit indiscriminate, perhaps so, some of them, right? I would imagine a rich man could die from a snake bite from a, a river, uh, from a Native American, uh, from hypothermia, uh, just as quickly as a poor man uh, migrating across the West. Um, you definitely have evidence of, of, of a lack of law and order in some areas for some window periods, chronological windows, uh, where they had to resort to vigilantism or deputies and marshals coming and sometimes just taking people back dead or alive. And so not a lot of due process. Uh, miners associations and vigilante trees, hanging trees, et cetera, right? You have people who mine the miners fairly well. You had people who uh, squatted upon land and got it for almost or literally nothing. So you, you did have, you know, some opportunities in the West that perhaps did not exist in the East for more people. But then numbers two and three, they run counter to it. And I kind of mentioned, mentioned the, the overall overarching themes of both of them already. Turner's thesis doesn't take into account the fact of the advantage that the wealthy still had in the West. And that basically is what you're looking at with number two. As I try to convey that in the West, as well as other places, it still paid to be rich. It still gave you a huge advantage, um, having more capital, more money to play with, more money to begin with, okay? And we mentioned as examples, mining, farming, ranching, and not to mention political capital, right? Uh, there was a place called Muscle Sloth uh, in Southern California. And at this place, you had a, the squatters come on land and uh, a local judge granted the land to them because they stayed on it. They worked hard and cultivating and improving the land. And, and they felt, you know, they had the judges slip uh, to show any authoritative person and they felt good and secure until the Kansas and Topeka Railroad came through their territory. And they said, sorry, you may have a local judge's permission to live here, but we have federal national Congress's permission. They're giving us not only the land where our tracks are laid upon, but a certain amount of acreage on both sides of the tracks has been granted to us by Congress. Well, at Muscle Sloth, they refused to leave. So then the Topeka, Kansas uh, leaders uh, sent in a, a deputy and a marshal. They shot at the deputy and marshal and killed one of the two. So then they used their political capital, their political influence, right, back in D.C., and they sent a regiment of soldiers to Muscle Sloth to force the inhabitants, the squatters, off those lands claiming that it now belonged to the railroad. So again, right, this is in the far west in California. Uh, it, it still pays to have money. It still gives you a leg up is the point conveyed on number two. All right. Then I put some sources here if you wanted to look into this, like the, especially with the treatment of um, 
of, of Hispanics or Latinos. Uh, that top one is great for the experience of Asian Americans as well. Strangers from a Different Shore by Ronald Takaki. But at any rate, um, just throw that out there. You don't have to buy any of those by any means. Um, so uh, let's see here. So now you see a discernible pattern, right? Of economic competition and xenophobia mixing in a combustible manner, right? Economic competition for mineral wealth, economic competition for land ownership, economic uh, competition for uh, wealth and cash crop farming and cattle ranching, et cetera, coupled by xenophobic stereotypes of the other, right? Put in that other category. If you look at least as early as Andrew Jackson's period in the 1830s in the loss in the Mexican loss of Texas, you find ample evidence of of racist stereotypes against Mexican people and Mexican Americans. And it would amuses me is the way that some of them are, are so contradictory. Uh, in one way, right, they were resented like the Chinese for taking people's jobs, but they tried to convey in popular uh, caricatures of the Mexican man at this time period that Mexican men were lazy. Well, how can it be both, right? Um, but what they did do, and also they contended that they were untrustworthy, violent, uh, prone to thievery, uh, et cetera. And so they really vilified Mexican-American men, Mexican men uh, in the mid to late 1800s, all right? Um, and then, of course, where you had cases of Mexican Americans fighting back against the system, fighting back against the gringo, um, the press just ran with it. And there was public outrage and desire, right, to say, hey, we must punish these, um, these banditos. So if you see in the pictures, you have uh, Tiburcio Vasquez. He was hanged and I believe San Jose, uh, Joaquin Murrieta, and Joaquin Murrieta was said to have been killed uh, not very far off of um, Highway 5 down by the Merced area. Uh, you had the uh, Gorras Blancas or White Hats, and they would try to um, cut the big corporate guys' uh, barbed wire fences and take back cattle or sheep that they contended that was theirs first. Uh, and then sometimes engaged in firefights, et cetera. The Gorras Blancas actually institutionalized though and formed a political party and actually ran Mexican-Americans uh, for political office. And so, um, but the word oftentimes used in the Chicano books, right, is proletarianization, proletarianization. And I'm sure I have it somewhere in here, but I'm gonna go ahead and type it right here. So the proletariat is Karl Marx's term, right? For those blue collar workers who labor with their hands in an industrial or agricultural uh, economy. So farm hands, right? Um, miners, railroad workers, factory workers, right? Et cetera. So the term implies that by the 1870s and 80s, Mexican Americans had become pigeonholed into the proletariat. And when I say pigeonholed, right? It's it's both it's both ideological and and literal, right? That literally, the only jobs they could seem to find were in the service sector, working as cooks, cleaners, maids, gardeners, landscapers, uh, field workers, factory workers, 
minors, et cetera, right? But that stereotypically the culture taught that that's all they could do, that they were not meant to advance and to become educated and to, to form any contingent of the white collar classes. And boy, what a step backward when you look at Tucson, Arizona, when you look at Santa Fe, New Mexico, when you look at San Antonio, Texas, when you look at Los Angeles, California, you find a rather large contingent of white collar Hispanics who were educated, who served as writers, who served as lawyers, who served as professors and teachers, et cetera. So they were being pushed backward. And you even had amongst those people, the Chicano historian state, kind of a sense of elitism of, of some of the, the white collar Hispanics in some of those cities that I named whereby they would say, hey, 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 it's one thing for you to treat the masses of Mexican-Americans like that, but can't you see I'm different? We're different. We're educated. We belong with you. And there was a sense of, of you know, uh, kind of a, an ambiguous sense that I come across the, uh, the Chicano books, because on the one hand, they were sold, they were, they were, they were depicted a bit as sellouts, bandidos, um, to their own people, but to the extent that they could not succeed under Gringo America, Gringo California, et cetera, a lot of them took the leadership roles over their own people in fighting for and demanding rights and respect and integration to be fully integrated into society. And a person I think is very fascinating who, who saw quite a fall, but yet was still able to be regularly elected by his constituents that were not only Hispanic and had some respect from Anglo America is uh, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, that Vallejo was named after. His is an interesting biography. So how did the Mexican-Americans react to proletarianization? Well, some acted fatalistically. They worked the rest of their lives, worked their hands to the bone, didn't complain, and got by. Some fought within the system. Like I said, the change of the Guaras Blancas. Some tried to run for or vote for Hispanic politicians to make a change through law. Some, such as those in Santa Fe and in San Antonio, uh, I, actually, I'm not gonna mix those two. Stereotypically in Santa Fe, they made a deal with the devil, so to speak, according to the Chicano historians, is they, they sometimes worked with, worked for, worked alongside uh, gringo corporate competitors and enrich themselves in the process. In San Antonio, they developed a reputation for insulation as well as Los Angeles, whereby they continued to be lawyers, they continued to be uh, teachers, writers, whatever it might be in, in the white collar milieu, but they did it for an Hispanic clientele. And they didn't even try to reach out to, to Anglo America because they felt, what's the use? So some kind of fought back within the system. Some fought back against the system. Joaquin Murrieta, right? His story uh, written by an Anglo American biographer, um, his story uh, serves as the inspiration for uh, the legend of Zorro. Uh, 
and you know that the the general theme of that of those movies, right? Of Zorro. So, in almost all accounts, however, what Hispanics did very well amidst this discrimination and and being kind of pigeonholed into the proletariat is they maintain their culture very effectively. A lot of which revolved around being Roman Catholic. Speaking the Spanish language, following Mexican American customs, etc. And I read a study on on miscegenation, uh, inter-ethnic sex or marriage, right? And they found, they, they showed stats on Hispanic women marrying, who married Anglo men. And, and the, the data, at least the area, the time period that they chose to study, uh, they over, these mothers overwhelmingly raised their kids as Hispanics. But number three also, right, is a bit of a refutation, goes against Turner's thesis. Because remember, Turner contends that the West renewed American meritocracy. Anyone, rich or poor, whatever color, whatever gender, could rise or fall by merit. All right, so are there any questions or comments? I have a question. Yes. So give me one second before you read it. Finish right in my mouth. I'm sorry, Cody. Sorry. I had to finish right on my notes. Um, I wanted to ask you about the rebate question. Can you hear me okay? I can now, yes. Okay. I wanted to ask you about the, the rebate for the railroads. Oh, sure. Uh, who, who were, who was um, the rebate going out to and how did that work? I wasn't really sure. No problem. That's a good question. Is it went out to the large scale um providers of farm produce, of minerals, and of oil, of steel, of just a, a, a broad array of commodities, virtually anything, right? Um, and so what really made it famous, as we get into in the next topic, Cody, is uh, Rockefeller. It became publicized about his rebates. He was getting, he was getting charged 65% of, of the rate of that everybody else was being um, charged. So he was getting a 35% rebate uh, per pound for his oil. But in, in return, right, for that rebate, he promised the transporters of his, of his crude and refined oil, he promised them three tons of oil per week. So they could, they could count on being able to charge per pound up to 2,000 pounds uh, every week just from him alone. And so it was kind of a quid pro quo thing, right? You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And so it was oftentimes informal. Oftentimes when the rebates were given, it was given with a handshake to, to I think, suggest that they knew that that was not fair and that that might even smack of something illegal because uh, oftentimes it's hard to find evidence of those rebates on paper, according to the historians, but we know they happened nevertheless. And because, you know, at that time, uh, we don't have anything at the national level to do anything about that, Cody. Uh, 
until 1887, known as the Interstate Commerce Act. In that act, we stated that all rates for storage, for transportation, et cetera, must be uniform. They must be uniform. They must be the same rate for everybody and shall be no discrimination in, in, in price rates. So until 1887, and then really even when you get to that, it wasn't enforced worth a darn. And so, yeah. You know, and another thing, as far as uh, information about these special rebates, right, and political capital, political connections that the big farmers and ranchers enjoyed, if you wanted to look up, um, I, I hope that I in, encapsulated a little bit in, in the Gilded Age. I think I do. But I also could have put it here because they were predominantly in the West. And that is the populists, uh, P-O-P-U-L-I-S-T-S. -S. Uh, the populist movement and the populist party. If you wanted to look into that, Cody, I think you'd be fascinated because they had a long list of grievances and those grievances were primarily against big business, big farmers and big ranchers, and the, the unfair advantages that they enjoyed over their smaller counterparts. Okay, cool. So I just want to make sure. So in essence, it was the railroads gave um, uh, like the the cattle ranchers or the grain men, they'd give them basically discounted rates at, uh, uh, at uh, selling their supplies to the railroad in exchange for uh, the suppliers uh, uh, meeting the demands of the railroads to fill up their train car. I think that's very well said. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. No problem. And so quite frankly, right, the small scale farmers, the small scale, you know, miners, et cetera, or whatever providers of whatever product, they, they didn't have anything to bargain with because they just didn't have that quantity that they could provide. All right. That's a great question, though. It, it's a very, like I said, I'm almost positive when we get to the Gilded Age, I have at least one number on the populist. And I think you'll 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 enjoy that, Cody. All right. Um, anyone else? Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, could I get a thumbs up from a few of you as far as feeling like you're with me? You, you, you have a, thank you, Ricky. You have a, a, a decent grasp of what, we, what I spoke about and what, what you're going to read. Thank you, Kennedy. All right, so good, good, Cody. Thank you, Amber. All right, so before I get off, I noticed a couple new names that weren't here at the beginning. And I want to be able to give you your credit. Remember, I give you five extra points added to your raw score out of 50. So when I do the West, when I correct the second, um, the second assignment, you guys will have uh, five points added to your raw score. All right. I feel like you absolutely earn that. I think I got all those names. All right. Okay, I uh, let me check one more. Yes. Good, good, good. All right. So I have all your names, you guys. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it a day. But I assure you, I mean, it might you might even be there already, uh, especially when I give you feedback on your first couple assignments. Uh, I may not always do that throughout the year. I may just give you a raw score. And by all means, you could Canvas message me and ask me why you got a 48 out of 50, et cetera. But, um, but at least on the first couple, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write specifically 
you know, something to let you know uh, how, how in line with my subjective expectations your write-up was. So you guys know kind of what to expect, right? As far as my, my own flavor, my own way of teaching the class uh, as we all differ as instructors. So uh, I will get on those soon, okay? Um, give you feedback and this will, I, I hope that you can enjoy this, that it does inspire a little bit of critical thought and uh, an interest. And it, it's gonna be, if it's not already, it's gonna become easy to you. But this is pretty much what we're gonna do throughout the semester. All right, so thank you guys. If there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and let you go and call it a day in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day. You too, thank, thank you. Bye, have a good day. Thank you. Bye you guys, appreciate you.